Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Understanding Dual Disability, Intellectual Disability and Mental Health webinar this evening. My name is Helene, and I'm the Workforce Development Officer here at the Western Victoria PHN. Um, I'll be your facilitator for this evening. Alongside me is Jade, who um, is also a Workforce Development Officer. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the lands and waterways in which we are all zooming in from today. We recognise their diversity, resilience and the ongoing place that First Peoples hold in our communities. We pay our respects to the elders, both past and present, and I wish to extend that respect to any First Nations people connecting in today. We commit to working together in the spirit of mutual understanding, respect and reconciliation. We support self-determination for First Nations peoples and operate organisations and will work together on closing the gap. Um, please ensure you complete the pre-session pre survey for this webinar. The survey data is held by ABT Associates, who are the external evaluators of the Primary Care Enhancement Program, supporting people with intellectual disability to access health project. De-identified data will be shared back with the PHN project team. For anyone attending this web webinar session this evening who is interested in further education opportunities on dual disability, we encourage you to register for the Project ECHO Intellectual Disability Information and Education Series, as the four upcoming sessions are also on topics relating to dual disability, um, intellectual disability and mental health, including assessments, support and treatment, positive behaviour supports and principles of restrictive practice chemical restraint reduction. Just a little bit of housekeeping. The majority of our webinar events are recorded and freely available on our PHN Learn YouTube channel. Jade has that um, slide up on where you can get that into the chat. It is now. I have our upcoming events on the screen. You can register for our events on our website. Jane has, Jade has that on the chat as well. Uh, please make note of the West Vic PHN Health Pathways on the screen um, that is related to this topic this evening. And for today's webinar, all participants will remain on mute. If you have questions, please type them in the question and answer box, not the chat box, and I'll ask them on your behalf to the presenter during question and answer time. Oh, Mick Struth will, he's, he's um, taking over section. All questions in the question and answer box are anonymous. We do we do know that for some reason the software does block the question and answer function um, for some attendees. If you have a question but don't have access to that question and answer box then type them into the chat box. However please be mindful that this will not be anonymous and please be always respectful to other attendees and, uh, and the presenters. Refraining from negative comments please. We ask that you complete the survey after today's webinar. We will put a link in the chat box and display a QR code on the screen at the end of the session. So I will now, now hand over to the facilitator for this evening's webinar, Michael Struth. Thanks, Mick. Thank you very much, Elaine, and uh, I'd like to welcome everybody here tonight. My name's uh, Mick Struth, and I'm the Senior Clinical Manager of Mental Health and Alcohol and Other Drug Services here at Western Victoria Primary Health Network. I'd like to endorse Helene's um, acknowledgement of our First Nations people, the elders, past and present. And I'd also like to extend an acknowledgement of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability, the topic that we're here to talk about tonight. Australia is a signatory to the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Article 25 of the Convention states that parties recognise that persons with disabilities have the right to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health without discrimination and on the basis on that basis of sorry and, and the base of disability. West Victoria Primary Health Network um, extends uh, a, a, a quite a number of commissioning services into uh, primary mental health care. We've established um, the Head to Health Service, which is currently run by NEMI in, uh, in Geelong, the Psychological Therapy Services, which extend right across our region, services for and service and treatment for people with um, enduring and persistent mental illness, the Wayback Support Service across uh, several uh, parts of our region, suicide prevention services, psychological support services, Headspace. In fact, I think we are now have a region we have uh, right across Western Victoria, we have the uh, highest number of Headspace centres and satellites 
for any PHN region, certainly in Victoria, but I think in Australia um, with the recent announcements and uh, a mental health response to natural disasters and trauma. So we extend uh, have quite quite a role in, in the delivery of mental health care across um, the region. And our role is not to duplicate existing services, but to work with um, our communities in a place based way to ensure that we're understanding what the gaps are and how we actually work towards better coordinating and integrating the system of care, a huge challenge in and of itself. We have uh, two guest speakers tonight, uh, Dr. Chad Bennett and Fanula Williams. And then we have two panel members, Dr. Robert Ward and Evelyn Kulnane. Chad is a, psychiat a consultant psychiatrist um, and, a, and a clinical director of the Victorian Dual Disability Service at St. Vincent Hospital in Melbourne. Fanula is a psychiatrist, a consultant in psychiatry of learning disability, West Fife Community Learning Disability Team and United Kingdom. Dr. Robert Ward is a general practitioner in the Western region of Victoria and a board member of Gateway Support Services. And Evelyn Colnane is a manager of Transition Support Services at the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne. Um, so what I'd like to do now is actually uh, warmly welcome um, uh, Dr. Chad Bennett. So just a little bit more on, on Chad before we move into his presentation. Um, I've known Chad for many years and been and been a great admirer of his work in this in this space and a great resource to me both through tertiary mental health, uh, primary care, uh, and um, and uh, services to young mental health services to young people throughout the time I've known um, Chad. He's a terrific resource and a very approachable professional. He's completed his medical training in London and also gained an, an honours degree in psychology. He trained in psychiatry at St George's Hospital in London and was admitted to a member of the Royal College of Psychiatrists in 1992, the same year that he migrated to Australia. He became a member of the Royal Australian New Zealand College of Psychiatrists in 1997 and has worked in community psychiatry and in the treatment of first episode psychosis before taking up his current position as a clinical director of the Victorian Dual Disability Service in 1999. Chad is currently the chair of the section of psychiatry for people with intellectual disability in the Royal Australian New Zealand College of Psychiatrists. So welcome, Chad, and we're really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thanks, uh, Mick. We've both been around far too long, I suspect. Um, um, webinars, I think, are a, a, a bit like a marriage. It's important to have low expectations. <clears throat> and um, I don't think that um, um, uh, webinars necessarily improve people's um, uh, ability necessarily to work with um, any particular population, but they they can help raise, I guess, um, awareness and knowledge of certain areas. So um, uh, my aim today is not to teach you skills, but to try and raise a bit of awareness uh, around this kind of area. Um, and I in in look i mean um, we also run webinars um and some of the stuff that i'm presented today is taken from these webinars and um uh if you go to the website you're welcome to register we also can provide in advice to anyone when they're working with someone with um, an intellectual disability um and it's just a question of phoning and i'm hoping everyone's seeing the powerpoint slide at the moment um but if i'm sure someone will let me know if they can't um, but we, we were primarily set up to work with um, public mental health services in relation to people with intellectual disability. And my aim today and, uh, 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 is really to kind of like make it, um, I suppose, to cover the con con some of the conceptual issues that I think are important to this kind of field. Um, and some of the things that we hear are the problems due to the person's disability or it's behavioural um, or they don't have a mental illness. And so I, I just want to really cover those kind of broad topics so people have a very clear idea of what is an intellectual disability? What is a mental illness? What's a behaviour disorder? And how these things relate to one another um, as a way of, uh, I, I suppose, a broad, if you like, philosophical kind of introduction to the area. So if we look at uh, intellectual disability, we go to our psychiatric Bible or DSM-5 uh, and we find intellectual disability is um, um, 
categorized under the first chapter uh, 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 along with a few other neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, uh, so there's intellectual disability, there's autism, um, there's ADHD and there's some communication disorders. And interestingly, one of the things we find is that these disorders are often comorbid. So um, I think that the rates of autism and people with intellectual disability is about 40 or 50 percent. And if you look at autism, it's about the same the other way around. So they're commonly comorbid. And we're finding increasingly, uh, as we become more aware of ADHD, that, that can also become a, um, an issue. And then often within that, you can get these kind of specific kind of learning disorders as well. So the kind of question is, well, what is an intellectual disability? And it's kind of one of those kind of things. We all think we know what it is. So if you look at uh, DSM-5, these are the diagnostic criteria. Um, so there's got to be evidence of uh, impairment in intellectual function. And, and the way that's determined is usually by an IQ test. But there are some people who have quite severe disabilities that can't undertake IQ tests. And you, you look at their, their function and their history and their um, uh, failure to meet the normal kind of developmental um, milestones. Associated with that, you've got deficits in adaptive function. So they are unable to do the things that you um, would normally expect someone of their age to be able to do. Um, and the way I always think about this is kind of like in terms of um, personal activities, so being able to wash, dress, clean themselves, um, domestic tasks and community access. And then you've got to have evidence of this um, uh, uh, being present in the developmental period. And unfortunately for us, we've all stopped developing because the developmental period only goes up to the age of 18. And beyond that, apparently we don't develop. Um, and this is really to, and I think this is kind of, uh, one of the things I find interesting about this is it kind of, it, it really makes it clear. It's just a, a, a fairly artificial kind of concept. So if you have an ABI at the age of 17 and it knocks your IQ below uh, uh, 70 um, you, uh, and affects your adaptive function, you'll have an intellectual disability. If you have it after the age of 18, it'll be an ABI. So it's a very fluid kind of um, uh, diagnosis, um, unlike the way we would normally think about diagnosis. Um, and I, I think it's important to begin to think of intellectual disability like that. And the other thing about intellectual disability, again, it's one of these kind of interesting kind of diagnoses. It's actually the only diagnosis in um, modern classification systems that's actually statistically defined rather than clinically defined. So even though I've been working as a psychiatrist in this area for many years, I'm using DSM-5 criteria. I'm, I'm unable to make a diagnosis because I'm not uh, trained in administering IQ tests and you need a psychologist to um, administer IQ tests. Um, but the diagnosis is uh, statistically defined as being two standard deviations below the mean, which is where you get an IQ of 70 or less. They did talk about at one time um, making it a clinical diagnosis. And certainly sometimes when I see older people and you can't find that evidence for deficits in IQ, I will sometimes make a clinical diagnosis of intellectual disability. But I'm very clear it's not using DSM-5 criteria. I'm making an, uh, a, a clinical diagnosis if that's what I think is um, uh, wrong with someone. Um, so it, it's an unusual diagnosis. Um, and then you get this group of people who have an IQ of between 70 to 80, which we call a borderline um, uh, intellectual function, which is not intellectual disability, although a lot of people seem to think that it is. And they'll often see people with IQs in that kind of range and um, use the term intellectual disability as applying to this group. Um, so it's people with an IQ of 70 or less before the age of 18, and that's associated with adaptive deficits. And I have seen people with an IQ of less than 70 who've got jobs and married and they've gone to um, get assessed as, uh, to see whether they've got an intellectual disability. And they're told they're not because they, they, adapt, they don't have the adaptive deficits that would meet the requirement for DSM-5. So there's three elements to the diagnosis. Within that, uh, you've got different different levels of intellectual disability um, and um, associated with those are, are, are different levels of function. And these days, 
the function are defined, I think, in terms of social function, um, community function, language function. So there's various functions that people look at. Um, and the severity is defined by function these days, not by I IQ. Most people with intellectual disability fall into the mild range just because it's, uh, that's the, the, the shape of the statistical curve. Most Some people with mild intellectual disability may survive um, relatively independently in the community, maybe with a couple of hours support a week, um, may even hold down um, jobs, get married, have children. So they, people with mild intellectual disability may lead quite normal kind of lives. And obviously the more severe the intellectual disability, um, the more support that they're going to need. And so for example, People are probably familiar with Down syndrome um, as one of the causes of intellectual disability and they'd fall into the moderate range and they um, would usually live in a kind of supported accommodation setting, um, would usually be able to get dressed and wash and clean themselves, but would need help kind of cooking and um, managing some of those kind of domestic tasks. Once you get down to that more severe level of disability, you're looking at people that require higher levels of support. And it's often associated with uh, more um, physical problems, language problems and sensory problems. And so this population has um, a higher rate of health problems. So the, it, it, and this applies to both mental illness and physical illness, that in general, the lower the IQ, the higher the prevalence of either physical or mental illness. Um, but most of the population, as I said, will be those people with a mild intellectual disability. Then, and again, I think this is the other kind of thing that, 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 that's interesting about this diagnosis. It's not like something like measles, where we know there's one uh, bug that causes this kind of illness. And even schizophrenia, although this view is changing, we, we kind of assume that there is a unitary kind of, it's a unitary kind of concept what we know about intellectual disability is actually there are many causes uh, and many reasons why people might have an intellectual disability um, so uh, interestingly i suppose in australia um, uh, the commonest cause of intellectual disability in my understanding or the last time i looked um, it, it is fetal alcohol syndrome, um, which is related to the high rates of alcohol use, particularly in the kind of remote kind of communities. Um, uh, people tend to think of Down syndrome, and that's uh, one of the, I think that's the second commonest, and Fragile X, I think, is now the commonest genetic cause. Um, but more and more, um, uh, they're cover uncovering, um, with the advances in genetic t technology, they're uncovering more and more causes to um, uh, intellectual disability. Um, in clinical samples, about 20% of the time will know the cause. Um, in research samples, you can get up to 35-40%. Um, and as you can see, there's a, there's a range of uh, different types of reasons why someone might develop an intellectual disability. Knowing what the cause of the intellectual disability is can be quite useful. And uh, again, I'm going to talk about Down syndrome just because people are familiar with that group of people. But they tend to be fairly cheerful, fairly social, fairly outgoing kind of personalities. And it's it's a characteristic personality profile, uh, though not everyone with Down syndrome has that profile, that seems to go with that particular genetic um, background. And we talk about these kind of um, uh, phenotypes or behavioural phenotypes. And there are some genetic syndromes that have um, particular uh, implications for both uh, physical and mental health. So um, uh, 22Q deletion syndrome have very high rates of psychosis. About 20% of them uh, will develop some kind of psychotic illness. People are probably fairly familiar with the idea that people with Down syndrome are at high risk of developing dementia as they, they age and it, um, um, it's very high risk and most of them show in post-mortem studies some um, evidence of developing dementia, uh, the features that would support um, uh, dementia. And then you get these odd illnesses like Prader-Willi syndrome, um, which involves um, uh, the, the main feature is kind of um, overeating, but interestingly, there's a particular pattern of inheritance, again, which is associated with a high rate of uh, 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 psychosis. Um, so it, it's interesting in the sense that they both 
provide some explanation sometimes for the ways that people might present um, but they also provide models for mental illness so uh, people are studying people with uh, 22q deletion syndrome in relation to trying to understand the development of schizophrenia itself because there's not if you look at the normal population it's been very difficult to identify any genetic cause that then leads to um, a, a, a psychotic illness so it's, it's an interesting kind of area so I just quickly wanted to talk about, so I, I guess the point I'm making is that when we're thinking about disability, we're actually, it's really important to understand that we're not talking about an illness. And this is kind of a, 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 a somewhat outdated way of thinking about what is a disability, but as, uh, it, it, there's various social definitions, but as a, uh, using a medical approach, I find this probably the most kind of useful. And the idea is that you've got an underlying lesion that gives rise to some impairment in function or loss of function. And in the old fashioned language, this would then lead to um, what they now call, uh, we used to call handicap, which is now called participation restriction. So because of someone's inability to do something, it means there are certain things uh, within everyday life that they can't do without support. And so disability is about that loss of function. And you can have different sorts of disability depending on whether on what areas of function um, are affected. So a very simple kind of model would be someone who perhaps loses a leg in a car accident is going to have a, um, a mobility disability. Um, and that then means that they're going to find it more difficult to do things like get around uh, to walk long distances and they might need support in being able to travel, for example. And so that's just a way of thinking about disability and perhaps the best way of thinking about disability is a person with a disability is someone who needs extra support to be able to lead a normal uh, uh, to be able to do the normal activities because i'm never sure what actually what a normal life is but to be able to do the normal kind of things that you'd expect people to be able to, able to do um, to live a life so intellectual disability is actually the consequence of a problem um, so it can be a, a range of causes and it can be associated with a range of different um, mental health sequelae, depending on the actual cause of the intellectual disability. So if we're adopting a medical model, you don't think about someone having uh, necessarily an intellectual disability. You think about someone who's got Down syndrome and one of the signs of Down syndrome is cognitive impairment and one of the impacts of that cognitive impairment is that person has then got a disability and the significance of that is that i don't think and i think this is probably the next slide and uh, i'm jumping ahead of myself is it's not a diagnosis and we often see this in, in in mental health that people will try and explain things in relation to the person's disability and it's just not a, a, a conceptual framework that lends itself to that kind of explanation because actually a disability is a result of some other kind of problem and you can't use the concept of intellectual disability to determine treatment or prognosis as you can for other medical diagnoses and the best way I think to think about it is, 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 is it's, a, it's a bureaucratic category that determines, determines eligibility for services because one of the, the features about this kind of population is it doesn't really describe anything about them. It's an incredibly heterogeneous population who have a range of different abilities, um, uh, not just IQ, but functional abilities, different personalities, different life experiences and present with a range of different problems. What it does mean is that people then get access to various services particularly in Australia they will generally get funding from the NDIS so that's a bit about the conceptual basis I suppose for intellectual disability um, it's interesting you would have thought it doesn't quite make sense to me because statistically you wouldn't expect as many as 2.9 percent of people um, would have an, an intellectual disability. The, the latest survey done in 2018 seems to suggest that about three percent of people have a, a, an intellectual disability which I think is probably an overestimate and with that they've got high levels of, of unmet need, high levels of um, both physical and psychiatric problems um, and often associated with um, uh, communication kind of problems. Uh, so I've mentioned that. Then we get to, so dual disabilities, to be honest with you, it was just a kind of term that we made up. Um, 
literally kind of like we, we were given the money to set up the service what should we call it got no idea and at that time there was dual diagnosis which was drug and alcohol and someone came up with the idea of dual disability it's not a a, a very good term but we're a bit stuck with it at the moment i just prefer the the kind of british term of um uh, uh psychiatry of learning disability i think if it's still called that the next question is kind of what is a mental illness? And, and again, kind of like, it's one of those kind of things we think we know what it is, but the more we think about it, the harder it gets. Um, this is one, uh, this is the images I found in the American National Library. This is actually what happens if you masturbate too much. This is what wankers look like, apparently. And the idea back in the um, Victorian times was that if you masturbate too much and sex wasn't good for you, it led to degeneration of the mind and um, uh, to, 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 to low IQ. And interestingly, there was actually a cure for it, which was this um, particular outfit. Um, and then uh, again, going back in time, one of the, the things that was considered to be a mental disorder back in the day uh, was homosexuality. And these are two penguins that... Um, uh, were male penguins and had a nest together and um, started taking turns and sitting on these various rocks. And um, everyone got very outraged that this is what happens when you put animals into captivity and how wrong it was. And it, this happens in New York. And, and, and of course, there was this other kind of movement saying, well, no, if the penguins choose to live like that, then that's OK. That's their kind of choice. And I, I, I guess kind of like the point is, is that in, in many ways, Mental illness, although we like to think of it as being like a physical illness where there's a clear cause, there's clearly cultural elements um, uh, related to our society and our values that make us determine what is a mental illness and, and, and what isn't. So there's no overarching definition. We don't have a good definition of what mental illness is. It's really um, problems, with, I guess, with higher mental functions that cause either distress to that person themselves or distress to other people um, around them. And for most mental illnesses, it's a clinical decision. Uh, I'm struggling to think of a um, mental illness that um, is dependent on a, that you can confirm with some kind of like biological marker. Um, so we're always dependent on clinical judgment to make a, a diagnosis of mental illness. And essentially, it's the opinion of a mental health professional as to whether something is a mental illness or not. And that's very much culturally determined. So it's kind of like a very artificial construct. And if you think about psychiatric disorders, again, it's a fairly meaningless term because I know that um, some disorders in um, Australia, such as people with dementia, are, are not usually seen by psychiatrists, but by geriatricians. Whereas in the UK, where I trained, uh, dementia was very much core business for a psychiatrist. So, um, and, and then you, you run into problems with what becomes um, uh, a neurological disorder. So Huntington's disease can present with a range of mental health kind of issues, including psychosis. But I have seen it being rejected from mental health services because it's a neurological disorder, because there's a, there's a clear cut cause for it. Um, so it's, it, it, again, it's not a useful kind of term. And then we get onto this kind of idea of it's behavioural. Um, and again, what I'd say is kind of like, well, most things in life are behavioural. In fact, the only thing I can think that's not behavioural in, in medicine is kind of like when you die, um, because then you're not behaving. But a behaviour, almost anything we do involves behaviour. So describing something as behavioural is not a particularly useful way to kind of like approach a, a problem. And there's a whole range of different terms that have been used over the over the years. And unfortunately, after a while, they all kind of develop these kind of negative connotations and people move on to different terms. So uh, they were called maladaptive behaviours, but in fact, from the person's view, they might be quite adaptive. They're called behaviours of concern, uh, challenging behaviours. If you look, there's various um, classification systems for people with intellectual disability, and they're called problem behaviours in those kind of systems. So there's a range of different terms for it. Um, uh, challenging behaviour, it goes back to that idea of um, it's when it causes problems to either the person and prevents them, uh, limits the opportunities that they can access, uh, or it causes problems to themselves. But that 
uh, understanding or that definition then provides, if you like, the, the ethical foundation for deciding, well, we need to do something about this. We need to intervene so that we can then help the person manage this behavior so that they're causing uh, to enable them to access more opportunities and to prevent them harming themselves. And you can see that in DSM-5. And so, in fact, under DSM-5, you could classify most challenging behaviours as a type of mental illness. Um, although, um, uh, it, again, for cultural reasons, we probably don't think like that. It, it, so, challenging behaviour is not just due to someone's intellectual ability in the same way you can't provide, uh, explain intellectual uh, mental illness in terms of intellectual disability or behaviour in terms of intellectual disability, you can't explain behaviour in relation to intellectual disability. It's really only useful, I find, for people who, uh, for whatever reason, are unable to explain their behaviour. So, for example, someone who's not um, verbal, anyone else, you're going to ask them, well, why did you do that? And Or you're going to try and understand their behaviour and try and work with them to understand was it because you were feeling anxious or because you were upset or was it because something something sent, said to you or, or, or what happened to make you um, um, uh, behave in that particular way? So if you can access someone's thoughts and emotions through conversation with them, there's no particular reason to describe the problem as being challenging behaviour. And in fact, if you think about it, there's a whole lot of normal people who have challenging behaviour. I mean, the prisons are full of them. Um, uh, the, 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 the mental health wards at most uh, hospitals these days would be full of people with challenging behaviour. It's just that we don't call it challenging behaviour because we apply other terms to, in those kind of situations. Interestingly, what you find, or what I find interesting, is that there's a group, and this seems to apply across most mental health diagnoses. There seems to be this hardcore of people with anxiety, with psychosis, or with intellectual disability, who present with persistent and severe kind of problems. And the research tends to suggest there's a, there's a group of people with intellectual disability who do have persistent and difficult challenging behaviours that are fairly resistant to, to um, um, uh, most interventions. And a, an instance of challenging behaviour, again, is not uncommon in most people with intellectual disability, but I find the same with toddlers. Most toddlers have some uh, challenging behaviour in, in the last month. Um, and usually, if you've got one challenging behaviour, you're going to have a, an, another challenging behaviour. Um, and, and I guess kind of, ah, um, oh, so this is a guy with leash nine syndrome, which is a very rare syndrome. And his problem is that he engages in really significant self-harm. And the reason I show this slide is just to illustrate that um, sometimes there's a purely biological cause for quite significant behaviours. We tend to think of it as being in relation to people's experiences, to their environment, or to changes, or in relation to their disability. But sometimes it can just be there's a purely biological reason for um, uh, the reason why someone might present with uh, a difficult behaviour. And in the same way, there's a range of uh, etiological factors related to mental illness is a range of factors that can contribute to someone having difficult behaviour. And I'm kind of aware that I've, um, I've probably gone over my 30 minutes. So... Still far, we, still far, we've got all right. a little bit early, so you've still got more time if you'd like. All right, sure, I can carry on all for far too long. But there you go. Um, so it's useful to think about both mental illness and challenging behaviour in a kind of biopsychosocial kind of framework. So it's looking at um, does the person have a particular syndrome? Do they have epilepsy? Do they have um, some kind of illness? Uh, what's their personality like? What's the, have they been exposed to a lot of trauma in their lives? Uh, what's their current social situation? What's their current developmental level? As a way of trying to understand why this person might be presenting with particular problems um, at a particular point in time. And you've got this kind of complex overlap, if you like, between um, mental disorders, which is this really broad term that includes mental illness and includes behaviour disorders, and to some extent also includes intellectual disability. Um, and then you've got this overlap with people having physical problems, um, so people who have painful uh, conditions uh, can present with difficult behaviours, 
people with intellectual disability can have difficult behaviours, they can have personality disorders in the same way that the normal population can have personality disorders, you've got to think about autism, and then they can have the full range of um, uh, diagnoses that we're all kind of quite familiar with, like psychotic illnesses, anxiety, depression, um, social phobias, all that kind of stuff. Um, and it's about trying to tease out um, these different levels of explanation, and this will depend to some extent on the quality of the information that you can get both from the individual and their carers. Um, they experience the same range of mental health problems uh, as the normal population. But whenever the research is done, what you find is you find a, a higher prevalence of uh, mental health problems in this population. And it depends how you define mental health problem. And I'm deliberately using that term because it's very difficult, for example, um, um, uh, to, well, in fact, I would say uh, once the IQ gets below a level of about 50, you can't use um, uh, the same criteria. So in someone who's nonverbal, they just don't have the cognitive capacity to describe experiences like um, auditory hallucinations or passivity experiences or delusions of reference. So you can't actually make a diagnosis of schizophrenia using the modern criteria that we've got for those kind of diagnoses. So it gets complicated. But if you look at it, broad brush kind of stuff, um, people with intellectual disability have higher rates of certainly identifiable um, mental illnesses, but also uh, yeah, thanks, Mick. Um, um, other kind of um, problems that require some kind of intervention that we don't, I would see as mental illnesses. The difficulty is that they're not kind of uh, the kind of problems that mental health services are now equipped to deal with, and nor do they see that as their responsibility to deal with those kind of problems. Um, and in fact, most clinicians in uh, most public mental health se settings don't see themselves as being adequately trained to deal with this population. And interestingly, in most of the training courses for both allied health and nursing and, and medical, there's very little exposure or very little about um, uh, intellectual disability. In general, uh, what I would say is that the principles are the same and what you're trying to do is to elicit psychopathology and fit it into frameworks and uh, into, uh, I guess, those diagnostic categories that determine prognosis and treatment. And the degree that you're able to do that is going to depend on, again, the quality of information. And one of the things that we found is that your normal psychiatric assessment, and this is kind of what you're trying to do in, in the exam, is you, you see someone for an hour and you come up with a diagnosis and a, a management plan. We think it takes about 15 to 20 hours for us to do an assessment. So one of the things we provide that I think your generic mental health service is, is can't do as well is we've got the luxury of time to do those more in-depth assessments and to access a range of different sources of information to try and determine whether this person's got some kind of mental health problem that warrants some kind of intervention. And you start off um, with your baseline um, uh, process and then you're going to have to modify it to account for that person's communication and, and cognitive deficits. And on that note, that's just broad principles. And then I hadn't realised this, but looking at the timetable, I'm going to talk about assessment some morning in the future. So I'm not going to talk about it today. I'm just going to leave that as a, a bit of a blank mystery for you. So I'll stop on that note and um, hand over back, back to Mick. Terrific, Chad, and thank you very much. Very um, thought provoking and um, I guess it, uh, it forces a reflection on the way that we think about the work that we do, the foundations for which um, services are designed uh, to make decisions about the scope of their work and to challenge the idea of eligibility uh, for people seeking help for a range of difficulties that they actually have and our need to understand this space uh, in a lot more detail from a certainly at a primary care level but also in our relationship with uh, our tertiary and specialist service systems 
So really appreciate um, the time you've taken to work through that, Chad. And sure. we'll come to questions uh, at the end of the session if you're willing to um, to take a few questions at the end. No problem. Given the time then and moving on through the um, through our schedule, I'd like to introduce um, Fignola Williams. Um, Fignola is a consultant in psychiatry of learning disability at Lindback Hospital in Fife and an honorary clinical lecturer of the University in Dundee. I was very interested to hear about um, uh, uh, the uh, Scotland family in Scotland, having just travelled through that area earlier this year and wonder why the hell people would come to parts of Australia um, when there's such a beautiful country in Scotland. But uh, I suggest the weather might have something to do with that. But um, what a wonderful country and a wonderful um, place it is. She completed um, her undergraduate medical degree at Edinburgh University in 2009. During and prior her medical training, she worked in social care with people with intellectual disability and autism. Following completion of foundation training, um, Finola specialised in psychiatry, choosing intellectual disability as a subspecialty. In addition to her clinical work, she has articles published in the field of intellectual disability, including the preferences of young people regarding sexual health services, management of alcohol use disorder, management of PICA, and the use of mental health law. Uh, Fanola is enthusiastic about educating doctors of tomorrow and other disciplines about the needs of people with an intellectual disability and is involved in teaching medical students from Edinburgh and Dundee. Welcome, Fanola, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction, by the way, Mike, uh, and I appreciate very much the invitation to come and uh, speak to you all. Um, hopefully everybody can see them now. Yes, they're up there, Fanola. Very good. That's super. That's grand. So, again, thank you very much for inviting me to speak. Uh, and probably uh, what I should make clear at the start of the talk is that I've, I've never been to Australia, let alone work there. So this Scott is this talk, sorry, is from a, a Scottish perspective and how um, our, our services work. So I was asked to talk a bit about how... Uh, multidisciplinary multidisciplinary teams work together so this is really about specialist intellectual disability services and and how we work jointly to provide care for our uh, patients um so, so the outline of my talk is i'll talk a bit about the setup of uh community intellectual disability services in scotland um the professionals that make up the teams that, that i work in uh, i've got some kind of fictional case vignettes of how we might approach a case with joint working and what different professions could provide in such a scenario um and uh i was partly invited to this talk because i uh, i was found online um having done a recruitment talk for the royal college for intellectual disability uh, psychiatry um so I'll probably end with a bit of the a bit about all the benefits of working in this specialty which i really enjoy i love my job uh, i don't think i could work in any other part of medicine so hopefully i can pass on some of that enthusiasm to you because it's an extremely interesting patient group uh, to work with uh, so uh, some of you may be aware of this, but for those who are not, I'll kind of go over it. The UK is one nation, uh, but we're also four nations. Uh, there are parts of government policy which are centrally controlled by the government and Westminster in London, so things like defence and border control. But there's quite a few areas which are devolved to the, the four nations, and one of those is health. So Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales and England all have slightly different health policy because they have, have control over that within their nation. There are a lot of similarities uh, between the four nations and everybody has access to National Health Service, so the, the NHS, so uh, universal access free at the point of access. There is, you know, there is private health care available in the UK, but most people will use the NHS. I've only ever practised in Scotland. Uh, you might have picked up from my accent that I'm, I'm not Scottish, I'm actually English, uh, but I've uh, been in Scotland since I went to medical school in 2004. So again, this is from a Scottish perspective rather than a UK wide or English perspective. Um, I do liaise with colleagues in England, sometimes at you know, conferences and the like. So I have some awareness of issues in England, but the situation is quite different to, to Scotland. Um, you've probably noticed already that learning disability has come up a few times. Um, it is the same thing as intellectual disability. The terms are synonymous. In the UK, the term learning disability has been used uh, sort of previously. There are moves in the UK to using intellectual disability instead of learning disability. And uh, the faculty in the Royal College is the faculty of intellectual disability now. Um, but uh, legally in Scotland, it's still the legal term under the Mental Health Act. And a lot of our services are still called learning disability services. Um, so it's the same thing. Uh, and I may slip into using learning disability rather than intellectual disability during the talk. But please be assured I'm, I'm talking about the same same thing. 
So uh, Scotland uh, is divided up into a number of geographical health board areas. As you can see from the map, some of those are a lot bigger than others. Um, much of the population in Scotland is concentrated in what's called the Central Bell area. So it's kind of the area that centres around the two big cities of uh, Edinburgh and Glasgow. So on this map, uh, number 11 is the NHS Lothian Health Board area where uh, Edinburgh is located and number six is Greater Glasgow and Clyde. And then where I work, which is number five, Fife, um, and number 10, which is Fourth Valley, where Stirling is, and then eight, which is Lanarkshire. That's all kind of the central belt area where much of the population is concentrated, um, kind of hence the smaller geographical areas opposed to places like Highland, which is number nine, which is huge, but with much less population density. So quite a variation across the country, but also within Fife, where I practice, there's quite rural areas, but you know also quite urban areas. Uh, we now have a city. King Charles came a couple of weeks ago and declared Dunfermline the city and other towns such as uh, Kirkcaldy, but then also uh, quite rural um, areas. So it's, it's I love working in Scotland. I'm very happy there. Um, it's a great place to work, quite a lot of variety. Another thing that's uh, important about Scotland is that health and social care are integrated. That happened a number of years ago. So there's kind of joint funding and management structures for health and social care. Um, I thought to, to put the development of community learning disability teams into a bit of context, I thought it'd be helpful just to briefly cover the development of uh, intellectual disability care in Scotland sort of over the last century. So in 1913, there was a piece of legislation passed called the Mental Deficiency and Lunacy Scotland Act, which legally um, separated the concepts of people having mental illness and what was termed then a uh, mental handicapped. It's no longer a kind of an acceptable term, uh, but basically it was the term used at that time for intellectual disability. Said to that piece of legislation, um, um, put an onus on district boards of control uh, to create um, institutions for the care of people with intellectual disability that were separate from asylums, which were for the care of people with mental illness. So each health board area in Scotland um, developed a large uh, intellectual disability hospital, which provided care. So basically, potentially people often went to live there for decades. People could be admitted at preschool age, uh, you know, as young as that. And some of them became like sort of villages in themselves. I've got a couple of pictures here. On the left, that's the ruins of Lennox Castle, which was the big intellectual disability hospital for the Glasgow area. And on the right, it's the Royal uh, National Scottish Hospital in Larbert, which is near Stirling. So some of these hospitals acquired farms for people to work on, also to provide food for the hospital. They'd have schools on site, um, they'd have uh, scout groups, guides groups. Uh, the hospital where I work, Limbank, used to be a large institution. It's now very small and we only have a very small number of inpatients, but you know, previously it would have facilities like soft play. But there was kind of more and more awareness that there needed to be a move away from the institutions from about the 1950s onwards. And by the 1990s, they started to close in England and Wales. Uh, Scotland was a little bit behind. First big hospital didn't close until 1999. Um, but then there was kind of a big government review called Same As You at the uh, sort of start of the 21st century, which said they all needed to close by 2005. And most of them did. So now what we have tend to have is what's called assessment and treatment units. So they're small awards, uh, which are for supposed to be for short term admissions for assessment and treatment of mental health problems and people with learning disabilities. So they're not designed to be homes for long term stay. People come in and get the treatment and discharge back to the community. There are sometimes difficulties with what's you know, called delayed discharge, whereby the person's packages of care in the community isn't quite ready when the person's kind of medically fit for discharge. So sometimes there are there are delayed discharge, but admissions are certainly much shorter than they were uh, historically when people would spend decades in hospital and, and that would be their home. So with more people moving to the community, um, there has been development of uh, community learning disability teams uh, to support their care in the community. Uh, I've worked in a number of health board areas in Scotland and the sort of makeup in terms of the professionals involved in these teams uh, has varied from health board to health board. Um, but in all the places I've worked, there's always been psychiatry, um, learning disability nursing, and these are specialist learning disability nurses who have separate training. They're not general nurses. They're not psychiatric nurses. Um, they are learning disability nurses. And actually, I often say there's few things more versatile than a learning disability nurse uh, because they do so much for their patients. And I'll come to talk a bit more about what each profession does in just a moment. The other core specialties we always have uh, are occupational therapy, psychology, physiotherapy and speech and language therapy. Some of the health board areas I've worked in have also had some of the creative psychotherapy, so art therapy and music therapy available. Uh, some have had dietetics within the learning disability team. Some health boards I've worked in 
patients with intellectual disability have had to access mainstream um, dietetic services. Uh, the place where I work currently, we have podiatry within our specialist learning disability team, but that's the only team I've worked in that has had podiatry. Most other places, the again, it's mainstream podiatry services for our patient group. And social work, some health board areas in Scotland are very closely integrated with their social work partners and have social workers as part of their team. Where I work and most of the places I've worked, we haven't had them as members of our team, but we certainly do work very closely with them. Um, a huge aspect of people's mental health with intellectual disabilities about them getting the right care. So obviously the social worker who makes the assessment and makes funding decisions and puts care in place is you know, a very important part of that. So in terms of what my role is in the team, uh, you know, some of the things that I do, the main chunk of my job is assessment and management of mental illness in people who have a learning disability. But there's also other roles which, for, for legal reasons, would fall to me. At the moment, in the Scottish Mental Health Act, there has to be a responsible medical officer overseeing the care of somebody if they're managed under the Mental Health Act. Uh, that's not the case in England and Wales, where they have what's called responsible clinicians. So uh, that doesn't have to be a doctor overseeing the person's care. But for now, in Scotland, it has to be a senior psychiatrist. Also, um, quite a, a big part of my job is assessing people's capacity regarding making decisions and potentially providing reports for guardianship. I imagine you probably have a similar thing in, in Australia, but um, in, in Scotland, it's the sort of legal mechanism by which the court can appoint somebody to make decisions on somebody's behalf if they are not able to make decisions by reason of mental disorder, for example. Um, and that an application for that requires sort of several reports, but that includes two medical reports, uh, one of which has to be by senior psychiatrist. So not infrequently, particularly social workers will come to me with concerns potentially about somebody who's vulnerable in the community and want me to make an assessment to see if they're able to safeguard themselves, able to make decisions. And then the social work department will decide whether they want to make an application. You know, it can be a relative or a carer uh, and it may not necessarily be uh, connected to a sort of acute situation where there's vulnerability concerns. Um, uh, but anyway, often I will be involved in assessment of people's capacity. Our community learning disability nurses do a whole host of things. Um, they do what community psychiatric nurses do, monitoring people's mental health, giving depots, monitoring for side effects. But they take a much broader health role uh, in promoting our patients' health and helping them access mainstream mental, uh, sorry, mainstream health services, not just mental health services, but physical health as well, and doing things like health screening, for example. We also have liaison nurses where I currently work. Um, they are really invaluable colleagues. So they're essentially learning disability nurses based within general hospitals who support our patients to access the care there. So they can be involved on the acute side if somebody's admitted acutely uh, to help liaise with the patient and their care team, but also the doctors and nurses in the hospital uh, to make sure those that person's needs are supported. Um, they can help with things like compiling of hospital passports. So that's a document that gives kind of a concise overview of the person with intellectual disabilities and their needs and can, can include things about how they communicate, how they communicate pain, um, you know, how they eat, um, you know, and you know, how they communicate in general and lots of other aspects of their care in a concise format so that somebody who doesn't know that patient can have that information easily to hand. They're also extremely helpful in elective procedures. You know, if a patient with intellectual disability is going for an operation, say, um, they might help uh, liaise with the, the team involved to ensure that becomes accessible and something that the person can engage with. You know, the person might need visits to the hospital beforehand for familiarisation. They might need to be placed at a certain place on the list in order to meet their needs. They might need to be admitted the night before if normally they wouldn't be. You know, uh, or it might be that if they were normally there the night before, it might be beneficial that they come in first thing in the morning instead. So basically, they will help liaise with the surgical, medical and other specialists to ensure that person gets care that's accessible to them. Um, psychologists do a whole host of roles. Um, quite a bit of it is direct therapy. Some of our more able patients can manage that, can manage things like cognitive behavioural therapy, cognitive analytical therapy in some cases, uh, you know, trauma related work. So they will sometimes do direct therapy. Not everybody's cognitively able enough to manage that and often a big chunk of the psychologist's work is to work with the carers or relatives who support them. Um, providing you know positive behaviour support plans, you know, which involves a degree of kind of behavioural analysis, looking at uh, behaviours and determining what might the triggers be, and seeing how they can be managed and avoided or reduced, and also looking at reinforcing consequences and how things can be modified to to avoid uh, sort of behaviour becoming reinforcing. Um, so uh, 
and also they involve a cognitive assessment, of course, assessing people have intellectual disability, uh, assessing people who may uh, be developing dementia to determine if there's a cognitive decline ongoing. So a whole host of roles and very important uh, colleagues. Occupational therapists, important roles in functional assessment. It's often important to know what our patients are are capable of partly to determine if they have a learning disability but also it may be that their skills are being overestimated by people working with them and that can be a source of frustration which can affect how their behavior and how they present um also uh, they can uh, support with kind of upskilling uh, people some occupational therapists at some places i've worked have done things like cooking classes to help people improve their improve their skills and they can make suggestions about uh, fulfilling ways for people to to spend their time to promote their mental health um, occupational therapists are also involved in sensory assessment. So people who've got uh, sensory processing uh, difficulties, so they may be oversensitive to certain sensations or undersensitive. So, you know, an example of that might be somebody that's oversensitive to sound who then requires ear defenders or somebody that's got tactile hypersensitivity who finds the use of sort of weighted things like weighted blankets to be calming. So an OT could make an assessment of that and make suggestions for interventions that can be helpful. A lot of our patients have physical uh, disabilities as well or mobility issues, so uh, physio are often involved. And speech language therapy, which I've shortened to SALT here, extremely important colleagues. A lot of our patients struggle with communication and that can really severely affect them. Um, anybody that's been to a country where they don't speak the language and tried to get help, you know, even with a minor thing, it's so much more stressful if you can't express yourself and people can't understand you and you can't understand what's going on around you. And for a lot of our patients, that's what their day to day life is like. And it can be very stressful. So speech language therapists can assess their communications abilities, can inform people working with them what their under level of understanding is um, and suggest interventions, potentially like signing or symbols or you know tailored um, verbal communications, easy read documents, things like that. Uh, you know, you might have be working with somebody who only has understanding at a one word key level, you know, and a, you know, maybe an example of how they might be affected by that is if a carer is having discussions saying, oh, I saw your dad two weeks ago. He's such a nice man. The person might only understand dad from that conversation and think, is dad coming? You know, if dad doesn't appear, that might lead to them becoming distressed. So if the staff are aware of their level of understanding, they can make sure they tailor the way they communicate with that person to avoid situations like that arising, for example. Um, some of our patients can't access direct psychological therapy, so the creative therapies like art and music therapy can be helpful. Uh, dietetics, quite a few of our patients have uh, artificial feeding, but also the, di the dietitians help with a number of other things, such as you know uh, people who need help with weight loss, um, weight gain, or you know if one of my patients has got an eating disorder, dietetics would be involved. Uh, podiatry for, for, for foot care, and I've already discussed the important role of, of social work. So that's what all these people do. And the thing I love about working in learning disability, oh, I've skipped forward a slide, apologies, uh, about working in learning disability service is that in all the teams I've worked in, all of the staff I've worked with have been really dedicated towards the patient group and really strong advocates for them and committed to providing them with good care and helping them access care. Um, a lot of my patients do have complicated needs, but I'm never alone in managing the ones who have that high level of need because there's almost always somebody else involved. Uh, who will be helping me meet their needs, but also, uh, you know, provide support and a sort of forum for discussion to uh, consider how best to help the person. All referrals that come in and all the teams I've worked in, we've had a kind of a central referrals meeting where somebody from each discipline is usually present and all the referrals to everybody come in and we discuss them all. It may be that the referrer intends the referral for, say, psychology or psychiatry, but we can discuss it at the team and think actually maybe occupational therapy is needed as well or speech and language or nursing. And uh, we can you know, discuss it uh, amongst the team and determine the best members of the team place to, to provide support at that time. Um, and it's also helpful because a lot of my colleagues have been in the service for a very long time and know a lot of the patients from the past and can you know, give information that's, that's relevant uh, as well to help inform uh, what we decide to do. Nursing and psychiatry are the only professions within the team that have specific learning disability training. So the nurses do, they're registered learning disability nurses, so that's a registration. I've done postgraduate training specialising in psychiatry of intellectual disability. All the other disciplines have informed me that they uh, have kind of generic training and they may get experience in learning disability uh, during their training or after qualification on the job, um, but they're not kind of trained as specialists. Um, 
most of my colleagues have said, you know, regardless of the discipline they're in, that recruitment intellectual disability uh, services is is difficult. And it's certainly the case in intellectual disability psychiatry as well, which is such a shame because it's just such a, a fabulous area of medicine to be working in. Uh, this is just a kind of uh, outline of, of the training of uh, psychiatrists in intellectual disability in the UK. So after graduation from medical school, it can be eight to ten years. Um, we all do kind of a couple of years foundation training after uh, graduation before choosing a specialty. So the kind of the most direct way in is to go into course psychiatry training where you do three years in a variety of psychiatric specialties um, and then choose a subspecialty uh, to focus on. Um, so that's kind of three years and three years. Um, you can do something called dual training where you do more than one specialty. At the moment, the only one that you can do with intellectual disability psychiatry is CALMS, which is Child Adolescent Mental Health. Um, that's five years rather than three, so it ends up being a total of 10 post-graduation. Um, there is also this entity called broad-based training, uh, which is a fairly recent development where people, after they've done their two foundation years, do two years doing a bit of PEDS, a bit of uh, general medicine, a bit of GP and a bit of psychiatry, and then go into the second year of course psychiatry training. Um, so that's how, how our training unfolds. So we do do three years of the specialty, just psychiatry of intellectual disability. Um, one thing which is uh, still an issue is in Scotland, I think sort of in the UK as a whole, is that although healthcare of people with intellectual disability has improved, they still experience significant health inequality and uh, life expectancy is about 20 years less than the general population. And this is something recognised by the government and they are you know, addressing it. They have put things in place through their learning disability strategy to try and help improve that and continue to, to work on that. Um, in terms of how people with intellectual disability access health services in Scotland, uh, I'm not sure about the Australian setup, but in the UK, it's largely GP led. You know, GP is generally the kind of gatekeeper to services. They all see the patient and they are the sort of primary physical healthcare uh, practitioner for people with intellectual disability, certainly in adulthood, um, and will manage things within GP, but then refer on to secondary care you know, specialties as needed. Uh, our nurses can often support patients with that if they're if they're needing referral on to secondary care and needing support and engaging with that. Um, oh, five minutes. Right. I better hurry on. Um, so and then uh, urgent care can be accessed by A&E uh, A &E departments. Um, some of our disciplines will accept direct referrals from carers and relatives. I, I tend to take them from other professionals and, and GPs and we will refer within the team. Um, as I'm short on time, I'll probably skip. I have some case vignettes, which are probably helpful discussions. Um, but just to mention, children have a sort of generalist community paediatrician overseeing their care. But in adults, that role tends to fall to the GP. Right. In terms of some examples of how we might work together, this case is a man in his early 20s with intellectual disability and autism. He lives at home with his parents. Uh, he's got support staff five days a week, giving you support with activities and activities of daily living. There's been an increase in recent months in aggressive behaviour towards his parents. There's been quite a few changes in his life, staff changes. His mum recently got a new job, so she's out of the house more. And when he's out in busy places, he can become aggressive too in the public. So how in general an approach, I mean, these are obviously very vague cases. We would assess each case individually um, to provide a kind of individual care plan. But it's important to take a biopsychosocial approach. There is a risk with people with intellectual disabilities that there is diagnostic overshadowing and things like underlying physical illness is missed. Um, Behaviour, um, agitated behaviour, changes in behaviour are a symptom and it's about finding the underlying cause. So in most cases where somebody's presented with a change in behaviour, I, I would want the GP to see them first to rule out something physical, especially if it's a very sudden onset. But, you know, with something like that, I would ask the GP to, to check out and rule out a physical illness, because even if it's something relatively minor, we have to remember that our patients have less cognitive ability and less communication ability. So they're less able to understand what's going on if they're feeling unwell and less able to communicate that and get help. So it can be very distressing and can affect their behaviour. Once the GP's ruled something out, we might have psychology see them to look at behaviour support plans, uh, speech and language to assess their communication. Occupational therapy, is this man under simulated? Does he need other activities? Are staff overestimating his ability? Does he need a functional assessment? Does he need a sensory assessment? Is he unsettled in public because he's oversensitive to noise? Social work may need to look at his package. Is his care adequate? Do his parents need respite and more support? In cases like this, unless there's a strong indication of mental illness, I may not necessarily become involved. I might do for an assessment, but generally the practice in the UK is that unless there's indication of underlying mental illness that regular medication for behaviour is, is to be avoided.
Second vignette, a young woman in her 20s, referred by social work. Not clear if she's got a learning disability, but some suggestion she may be needed help at school, but is able in some regards. Real concerns about her social vulnerability. Um, she's had multiple partners, some of whom have abused her. There's concerns about financial exploitation, concerns about use of drug and alcohol. So she could be assessed to first confirm she's got an intellectual disability and also what her abilities are. So be seen by psychology, occupational therapy, speech and language could advise about her communication abilities. I might see to assess her capacity and inform whether the social work decides to take guardianship for this woman. And it might be that she has a brief inpatient stay to allow these assessments to take place in a less chaotic uh, environment and one where she hopefully could be free of alcohol and drugs. And just my final case vignette, um, a young woman, of, uh, sorry, a woman in her 40s, intellectual disability and autism, has gone off her food. She's losing weight. She lives in 24-7 care. She's expressing that she's unhappy and the GP's referred her in. So in a case like that, again, I'd want to be really clear that the GP's thoroughly assessed this woman, ruled out any major pathology. You know, is this an occult malignancy? But also treated minor sort of GI complaints, things like constipation or reflux that might have put her off her food. And again, because of her disabilities, um, she may respond in, in a different way to that than, uh, than other people because she's less able to understand. Um, hopefully, uh, Finn, you'll be able to um, dial back in. Uh, but what I'd really like to uh, I'd like to thank um, Fanula for the presentation to date and the vignettes to, I guess, provoke our thinking and, and reflection. One of the things I was reflecting on was some of the commonalities between our system here in Australia and the system uh, in Scotland. Uh, but also some of the timeline, the timelines that may be similar, but some some are extended, and also to highlight um, some of the challenges that uh, that face and the the need for uh, multiple minds and lenders to be looking into what is, uh, for all intents and purposes, uh, complex but a very important part of our our healthcare system. So on that note, um, I'd like to uh, introduce our two chair members uh, or panel members, um, Dr. Robert Ward. So Robert, I spoke about earlier, um, after studying medicine at Melbourne Uni, um, Robert returned to Geelong and was the was a resident at the Geelong Hospital before entering general practice 27 years ago. The birth of his son 25 years ago introduced him to a world of intellectual disability and to local service providers. He's been on the board, a been a board member of Gateway Support Services for 23 years has experienced disability from uh, the perspective of a very busy general practice, the eyes of a parent and the challenges of a large provider of a disability services. Over patients and families journeys over a period of time where the service provision for disability has undergone a seismic shift with the NDIA. More recently has been involved with Western Victoria Primary Health Network Spider Project, exploring the challenges faced by people living with intellectual disability, accessing healthcare, and the health disparity they experience. I'd also like to additionally um, welcome Evelyn Colnane. Evelyn leads the transition support service at the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne, uh, caring for young people with chronic medical conditions and intellectual and developmental disabilities transitioning from paediatric to adult health services. Um, Evelyn is, a passionate, is passionate about improving the healthcare of people with disabilities and has developed an innovative transition model for adolescents with dual disabilities at the Royal Children's Hospital. I guess the first point I'd like to um, make or invite is for um, Robert and Evelyn to um, listen to what your um, reflections and questions uh, that the two presentations have um, triggered for you and any general comments that you would make from your work and your observations throughout your careers and experiences to date. So first and foremost, uh, Robert. Oh, th thanks, Mick. I, I was just blown away by Fianola's presentation about the services available in Scotland, because that's, um, I find it probably the, the, the way she talked about a team and the way she talked about the team communicating with each other um, is a far cry from what I often experience in general practice um, here, um, where as a GP, I can be looking after someone with um, a, quite a profound intellectual disability and the behaviours of concern we talk about. And I'm presented to try to sort out that, that problem. And I don't even know who the occupational therapist is or the speech therapist. I don't even know my patient that I've looked after for 
10 years has an occupational therapist that's been seeing them you know fortnightly you know i don't know their behavioral support person i don't think we're very good at coordinating and communicating with each other and i've been asked to make decisions about medications and you know what are these behaviors of concerns and how can we treat them um and i don't know the people in the team and maybe that's me not reaching out or not being available but or just we don't have a good way of communicating and to hear Fionola talking about you know fortnightly team meetings and putting everyone together on the same page was just amazing um and i found it you know i think we're all in our silos here um not communicating um certainly not in the way that she describes in that and i i thought that was wonderful her presentation i'm so sorry i had a bit of technical problem there uh, so just back to this uh woman in her 40s with sort of not eating being off her food appearing unhappy so again you know as i said a thorough physical assessment to make sure we're not missing something organic dietetics undoubtedly would be involved uh nutritional assessment and input supplements if oral supplements weren't enough there might be a role for gastroenterology to become involved consider artificial feeding you know even for, for a temporary period um layers on nursing to assist with the person accessing uh, hospital investigations community nursing to provide health monitoring i might be involved to assess for assessment and treatment of you know mental illness is she depressed um or a mental disorder and social work is she unhappy in her placement is that contributing to her mental health uh, or you know is the current place meeting her needs that's grand thanks wonderful finn thank you very much uh, again for that terrific presentation and and for overcoming the, uh, the international um, techno technological barriers too. It's, um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to have you and, and for you to Thank give you. the time uh, uh, to help us uh, better understand your work and think about how that might influence the work that we can do here. Evelyn, just in, rela in relation to um, the two presentations, what's your immediate uh, reflections and, uh, and thoughts around um, our work in this space? I think um, similarly, um, as Robert said earlier, it's a, it's incredibly impressive the work that Vanilla is doing with her team in Scotland, as well as Chad's multidisciplinary approach to assessment. I think one of the challenges that we face with patients with intellectual disability moving from paediatric to adult care is the disparity in the type of service that they transfer to and and access to services. So, um, and and largely based on um, the, the system that is in Australia. So, for example, um, paediatricians have capacity to prescribe stimulants and antipsychotic medications. However, a lot of GPs may not. And so um, we are reliant on private adult psychiatrists, which are um, not accessible and not, um, not uh, feasible for a lot of families on low income. And so that, that provides a challenge for us in the adult healthcare space. I think also access to um, tertiary healthcare services for people with dual disabilities too. Um, we often assume that people can access healthcare and, and it is free, free for all, but for people with dual disabilities who might have additional challenges um, with mental health or behaviours, I might find it very difficult to access the healthcare setting. So we put in place um, systems like planned code grades where we can get specialised multidisciplinary uh, behaviour support teams in place to preempt admissions or preempt outpatient appointments um, to support families and to support people with disabilities before they come into the hospital. Um, and I think also the third point that I'd like to make is, is how do we actually engage with GPs um, prior to transition into that the, the chasm of adult services. Um, often we found we ran a study at the Children's Hospital looking at how many families didn't have a GP prior to transfer to adult care, and as high as 40 to 50 percent of families did not have a regular GP. So to expect that GPs can pick up and know about the patients and know how to manage their care um, is is probably not a realistic expectation. Um, so we've developed a process of um, promoting the idea of shared care with GPs at the children's just to help to support families, help to support GPs um, prior to the, the change actually occurring, um, which can be quite daunting for a lot of families and, and people with disabilities. 
I think there are absolutely essential points that you make. Um, Robert, um, Fanola came uh, back in on on uh, on the camera just prior to you finishing off. Was there anything else that you, any other comments that you had um, prior to asking questions more broadly? Oh, look, just, just to thank Fanula for all her work that she's doing in her presentation. It was brilliant. And I was probably just talking about the quite a different system and how the, well, the importance you seem to, to put in the, the working as a team and the communication of the team and for people on that team to have experience with intellectual disability. Um, I think our system here is maybe a little bit different where we're all quite siloed in our own practices and we probably don't, the health professionals looking after the same patient may not even communicate with each other um, for people with quite complex needs and I think that's a certainly a deficit in our system here and something we probably need to work on um, and whether that's a, a function of the, the funding model um, for all the individuals it's the you know we have a funding model over in Australia with the NDIS paying for giving funding to the patient to give to um, health professionals and I think we all tend to stick in separate separate lanes really and we don't don't get together um, to make any sort of common goals or plans and I think that's a very sad um, predicament for some patients. So congratulations on what you're doing because that sounds wonderful as, as a general practitioner I would love that service. I guess for our region too, uh, the challenge is how do we um, utilise this type of information to improve what we have locally, uh, particularly as it relates to the integration and coordination of care in this space. And I was really in, um, interested to note too, um, Fanula, the the um, the life expectancy uh, and the 20 years um, a discrepancy between that of the general population. Um, which we find here in terms of mental illness and um, and disability in Australia as well, and most often of uh, chronic diseases rather than um, you know what we determine to be the mental illness or a, uh, an intellectual disability. It's often the chronic diseases that people are dying of much earlier. So the inequity in terms of healthcare and the role of general practice in healthcare is vital to us making a difference in that space. Uh, and we share as a uh, a pair of gen. A, um, that we support the equally well consensus around making a difference um, as we as we design and improve our service system. Um, I invite comments too around the idea of um, medication prescribing and and um, and the access and support and advice, and also the risk of um, um, prescribing medications in the absence of that advice and the potential harms that can be done as well and to seek your your views on that as a as a panel and as two guest speakers. Whoever would like to go first. So I'd, I'd probably like to to comment certainly about prescribing as a general practitioner. I probably you know inherit a number of patients who come to me later on in life um, on antipsychotics and you know, no clear diagnosis of a, of a mental illness of such. I mean, it probably gets maybe included in their past history just to justify them being on an antipsychotic. Um, uh, but really, when you look back and you think, yeah, does this person just have an intellectual disability or has the, they had behaviours in the past that have just been interpreted in a different way or managed in a different way if that was 10, 15 years ago? And how do I now look at reducing that Antipsychotic, antipsychotic medication in a supportive way when everyone's so frightened of triggering off a behaviour, you know, of them smashing their head inside the bus or running off across the street or, you know, causing a, um, a support organisation some grief who's looking after them in a residential home. Because without the support of necessarily, you know, a, a, a specialist psychiatric unit, you know, close by. Any thoughts or comments for Nola or Chad? Yeah, I, I, you know, it's it's difficult and often it is a case of uh, sometimes picking the right time as well. You know, if you've got somebody that's going through life changes, for example, that is not necessarily going to be a good time to, to reduce medication. I suppose mm -hmm. it also depends on the degree of side effects or adverse effects of of doing it, of how 
quickly you need to consider start doing it um i mean each case i would assess individually right it, it can be quite difficult particularly if carers are you know quite understandably anxious about uh, medication being reduced um and another thing is is trying to do it slowly as possible you can um sometimes i will put patients on liquid preparation so that i can reduce it extremely slowly in the hope that that will be more successful than mm. you know dropping it dropping it more quickly but yeah it's it is uh difficult you know i do aim to try and you know, only people have on the absolute medication that, that they need. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it is, it's a difficult processing, uh, process reducing and, and withdrawing uh, psychotropics in this patient group. And I think it's also for a general practitioner who may not have that confidence or experience um, in doing that because you may not have many patients and the only information you get is about the, the patient is from the disability support worker who's, a, who's accompanying them to the um, to the appointment and their preconceived ideas about what's a behaviour of concern and what's a mental illness and what's that's how you're getting a lot of your history. So it is a complex task. It's very poorly regulated. Interestingly, in uh, Tasmania recently, they decided that um, anyone who can't consent uh, being treated uh, with psychotropic medication should be under the Mental Health Act, which has caused a huge amount of panic, of mm. course, because because they suddenly discovered a whole lot of people that should be under the Mental Health Act. Um, and they're still, the, the government at the moment appealing for it. But I don't think there's a good governance over the prescription of medication for people with intellectual disability in, in Australia. Um, so um, it's very much kind of like, on a, you know, like, I mean, I don't think anyone's governing it. They're just given medication and that's it. There's, there's no thought to who's consenting and what they're being treated for and how to monitor and follow it up. And in, in fact, they often get diagnoses as a way of um, uh, uh, avoiding kind of um, uh, too much scrutiny. It's an, it's an ongoing and very real challenge in Western Victoria, um, Chad, as well. And um, we've had quite a number of inquiries as a primary health network about what can be done it is a significant system gap um, in primary care and what used to be available in some parts of the region uh, was withdrawn and no longer available to get that specialist advice uh, and secondary consultation and has become part of the Royal Victorian Royal Commission's recommendations and there is um, some um, movement towards addressing that through the establishment of the mental health and wellbeing locals um, as they are established in our region. So there are some challenges ahead about how we integrate this system locally better and um, and look at uh, look at how we actually engage in more interdisciplinary ways that support people and how the primary care system can interface with the intellectual with the NDI NDIS and the NDIA and the specialist tertiary services as well to actually enable um, that level of support for general practice and primary care um, for people who are choosing to, to access the healthcare through primary care. So there are some challenges, there are some um, movements afoot. One of the other questions I had um, for you as a panel was, and noting your comment before, Chad, uh, in your presentation around the dilemmas of diagnosis and eligibility and the way in which that is applied to either include or exclude people from accessing um, the help that they're seeking um, and how we do that better as a system. Um, and one of the comments and one of the things that we've been working on locally is rather than using ideas of eligibility, um, using a concept of um, levels of care and how we might lean in. And then once someone has accessed and determined a level of care, how do we collaborate and support navigation to the right level of care rather than whether someone is eligible in, or ineligible for a particular service? And often given the information you presented when that doesn't make sense, uh, or it's hard from a logical point of view to actually understand why someone may or may not be eligible. Um, so any thoughts or reflections on that as it relates to people with dual, um, dual diagnosis or intellectual disability and mental health issues that uh, are presenting as problems when they're seeking help? It depends what you mean by level of care, I suppose, uh, uh, and how you would measure it and how that then determines service uh, the eligibility and delivery. Uh, uh, so I'm not sure that I understand that kind of concept. So what's been what's been developed and is being trialled at the moment is um, 
a decisional support tool in mental health, not in dis not in intellectual disability, but for um, through an assessment determining um, what type of care. Oh, sorry, what through an assessment there's a decisional support tool where there's um, domains, eight domains for um, primary and uh, for contextual that actually at the end of the assessment when applied particular ratings around the domains suggests that this person might benefit from this type of information, this type of intervention, these type of combination interventions, this type of workforce, coordination of care, so on and so forth, and what types of disciplines might be um, available to do that. And so that when that's then used to discuss and collaborate with a person, what level do they think might they benefit from? What resonates with them, and how might they access that within the system that is um, available? And then being supported to navigate to the type of professional and teams and service within their local area to actually access and be supported that in in that particular um, area of need. So the idea that when someone actually accesses a service, they're not on referred onwards; they're actually supported and navigated to get the further advice in a collaborative way rather than um, rejected in terms of being not eligible for the help that they're seeking. Um, so it's a, it's, a con it's a construct or a concept about how do we lean in and work together rather than how do we reject and refer onward or redirect referrals so that we can actually respond to people at the uh, at the time of their need and when they're seeking help. So that's the the concept behind it. So there is there will be more work coming out in our local region around what that means, what that tool is, and how we systemically use that to actually support our communities better and fill in the gaps um, within the service system. Just to quickly respond to that, I think kind of part of the difficulties are that there's no um, service available in the same way that there is in the UK that can provide that holistic approach. So, you, you, you know, like if you're looking for psychiatric services, you're going to struggle to get a private psychiatrist and public mental health deal with serious mental illness. So you, you, you can do that kind of. So what we find is, sure, you can work out what the person needs, but actually there's then it, it's not about eligibility. Well, I suppose it is about eligibility, but there's no service there then to provide what they need. Um, so at the moment, it's kind of interesting. The government's trying to talk about kind of service navigators and helping people navigate through the service system. But in fact, what we find is that there's just huge gaps. And what we spend most of our time doing is explaining to people, yeah, we understand what your problem is. There isn't a solution. When you get stuck, just take them to the emergency departments and don't take them back until it's sorted out. Yeah, I think that's uh, been um, heard quite loudly through the um, Royal Commission as well um, about and the, their recommendations. So it'll be interesting to see how the the um, recommendations are implemented and how we do that in consultation with each community and particularly that's a, a very clear focus for us in Western Victoria about how that how those services will be rolled out and particularly with the bipartisan sorry not bipartisan the bilateral agreements that will be about co-investment from both Commonwealth and state governments into um, into our region and across Victoria. So how, how will um, general practice be better supported where it requires specialty and a specialist uh, in this space, uh, as well as other other areas of, of treatment and support or assessment treatment and support as it relates to, to mental health? It's, it's oh. certainly from, oh, sorry, Chad. There you go. Oh, look, I was just going to say the Royal Commission that, that didn't actually say very much about dual disability at all. Um, so it's not clear at all what's going to happen. But I just wanted to add that the, the, you know, the service I provide is so dependent on the team that I have available, you know, and so as a psychiatrist in isolation. I mean, there are some people that see just me, but, you know, I have to have that team available to provide people with the care that, that I feel that they, they need. So I'm very much dependent on my, my MDT. Terrific. Look, on that note, I'm aware of the time and I, I really want to take the moment to thank um, Fanula and Chad for your for your very thoughtful presentations and thought provoking presentations, and also um, to Robert and Evelyn for um, reflecting on that and thinking about well what do we need in our area and and whilst we don't have an immediate um, response to this, there is a a growing wave to be able to address the needs locally 
and we need to work together about how um, we start to address some of those Rather than what can't we do, what can we do and what is available within our within our region and what else do we need and, and keep lobbying and advocating. On the basis of that equality in service access, quality in service provision and in quality in terms of quality of life and opportunity in life. So, yeah, again, I'd like to um, thank everybody for uh, attending and for um, yeah, very thoughtful presentations and, and uh, contributions. There is that survey. The please um, complete the post session survey. So I just request any, everyone, all the participants, to um, please um, scan uh, the survey and uh, and give us some feedback around how helpful and any suggestions that you think might be uh, important for us to be aware of uh, in this series. So thank you very much.